I literally took everything out of my bank accounts, sold all my stock. Crypto trading activity hit a new high, new record. Maxed out two credit cards and took out cash advances and threw it all into the ocean. The film is a roller coaster ride into the last few years of how technology is changing our relationship to money. So, you know, how are we seeing you know, the rise of phone apps, uh, zero commission trading, um, social media affecting all of us in our relationship to money and how we invest, save, and get access to financial information. I just became a millionaire by spending all my money on Dogecoin. Really just trying to answer the question of why was he making the dis this kind of decision? Um, and, the, and the answers we came to were actually much more complex than I imagined when I began. It would be easy to write him off as an idiot, but I think there's much more systemic factors at play that were driving Glauber to make this decision. In many ways, his primary motivator for getting into this was honestly frustration with the system of wealth inequality, with his lack of access to traditional financial markets. So, you know, Pro is a undocumented immigrant here in the US. So he's had a lot of trouble getting and holding stable jobs. Um, he, When he got to college, he was denied entry due to lack of papers. 50% of Americans don't have $500 of savings at any given time. The film does not, um, uh, look down upon someone for making a poor financial decision. Any of us are susceptible to this stuff. Um, there's real systemic and cultural factors that make it very, very difficult for people to navigate their, their money. Financial advice is really can be such an important tool for people. Um, studies have shown, for example, here in the US that a holistic approach to financial advice can save the average household about seven and a half percent of the annual income. But, you know, something that has limited financial advice historically is a bit of a mis conception around what it is, how expensive it is. People are also really intimidated. They don't know how to get started. And so these access barriers are really hard to break down. And that's where social media has played a really important role. We know that the demographics, you know, we're becoming more diverse. There's more women, there's more people of color that hold wealth than ever before. These people have traditionally been excluded from financial markets. And so they're looking somewhere to go that they feel comfortable and kind of it, they can relate to the person providing the information. It's helping people identify some basic elements. I think one, is this video sponsored? If it is sponsored, by who? Who is that? Who has the incentive to be teaching me this, this information? Um, yeah, two, um, what is the background of the individual I'm, I'm hearing information from? And I think the third one is, you know, be very aware of the promises that someone's making you. If someone's telling you, uh, you know, you're gonna a thousand X your return, or if it's too good to be true, it might be. Make sure that you're using multiple sources before you put your money into anything and don't put it all into one thing.
it's really been at the request of college students who say, hey, we don't have classes that are teaching us this stuff. We know from our research that there's a lot of empirical links between offering financial education courses in high school and college and improve credit rating scores, improve debt management, etc. If we have any any shot at challenging the wealth inequality problem globally, it's going to be through financial education. Um, you know, in the U.S. here, 90% of stocks are owned by 10% of Americans. It's it's a fundamental problem, and we need to welcome in more and more people from diverse audiences to to gain access to financial markets and and hopefully provide them a ladder, not just a trampoline, which is you know how people are looking at some of these crypto investments. expensive if you don't deal with it it's could be catastrophically expensive if you deal with it the way we are right now 
money has to go into it in order to be able to make uh, progress in mitigating the uh, sticking to the one and a half degrees and such. And then there's going to be adaptation. Adaptation means that, you you know, with climate change to, uh, changing, then there have to be seawalls that are built and other things like that. So any way that you cut it, it's going to be uh, very expensive economically. But beyond that, it's going to be very existential. It will cause great migrations. Um, it'll cause great turbulence. It's estimated now that only about one-sixth of the amount of money that is needed is being, come, being obtained. And so we have a situation now where I think one needs to think who has the money and what are their motivations. show it and people fall in love with the ocean and care about the ocean. I've seen direct impacts on legislation and so on in order to protect the ocean. So that's my particular passion to be able to have that big impact on the ocean. philanthropists, but that's tiny by comparison. Total worldwide, about two trillion, and most of the money goes to uh, religious organizations, hospitals, university. It's only two percent or so goes to climate issues. The biggest pile of money is institutional investor money, and so since that's an area that I know about, and I know that there would be the motivation to invest in this area, if they can be made so that there's a return that that's important because anybody, institutional investors, still has a constituency to take care of, so they have to pay attention to the returns. They just can't give money away.